I was watching this documentary last night and it had me thinking about maybe your situation and that is these filmmakers had been accepted into this prestigious program mm -hmm. and they thought they'd just try it and when they got the letter they almost felt like someone was playing a joke on them that they got in. Yeah, absolutely. Did, was that and then when we were talking off camera that that sparked this quite so was that something that when you applied to leave um, you said Hendrix yeah yeah so so basically I, I applied to film school uh, kind of as a a built-in excuse to not pursue my dreams if that makes sense so I I, I was just like I'm gonna apply to uh, I'm gonna apply to USC film school and no one gets into there so I'm gonna apply get rejected and then I can say I tried, and then I can go about my life. And I was gonna work at like a, like a gas company in Arkansas. Like that was, <laughs> that's what I was gonna do after graduation. And um, I ended up actually not doing that, and I worked as a youth director for a little while. But uh, so I applied to USC in the middle of planning my wedding, basically. Oh wow! And I got a a response one one day, like literally an email that said, uh, it, like the subject line was like. RSVP for admitted students day because I, I guess they sent the email in the wrong order oh. And I was like admitted students say what does that mean? And then a few minutes later I got like a admission decision thing So I, I found out kind of in reverse and I was so confused and I did I thought someone played a joke on me and I and I found out I got uh, I got into USC about two weeks before I was gonna get married and um so I was so stunned and I was talking to my wife and I was like, so like, I, I'm not gonna go. And she's like, no, 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 you have to go. Um, and my wife was in the middle of uh, pharmacy school at the time. So she couldn't just pick up and leave what she was doing. So that meant like uh, she, she pushed me to say yes, to pursue my dreams. And so we got married. And then literally two weeks later after we got married, I moved to, to Los Angeles to start film school. It was pretty wild, yeah. But uh, it was amazing because, like, um, and it's just a testament to how awesome my wife is. Like, yeah, if she absolutely. hadn't have pushed me to say yes to go pursue your dreams, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have done it. I probably wouldn't have. And so, then, how long before she joined you here? Uh, so we were apart for two years. Oh, so for the first wow. two years of film school, I I was just out here by myself um, in a long distance marriage, wow. which was pretty pretty wild. But it, but it worked out great. Wow, that I think that'd be tough for a lot of people to be separated for a long time mm -hmm. like that. And plus, you had you been to Los Angeles before? No, no, I'd never, I'd never been to California at all. So it was like one of those like almost uh, fish out of water experiences. Like I got here, and I remember one of the first things it was just showing up at LAX. It's just uh, it's scary. It's scary. It is, it's yeah. terrifying. You're like, wait whoa, this one terminal is the size right. of my entire airport where I'm from, you know? Right. And so, and you know how the cars circle and they yes. just keep circling. It's called panic attack circle. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> and like, I, I like stepped out of the airport and suddenly uh, I was like, it felt like I was in a completely new planet, um, you know? And then, then what was weird is that I remember uh, when I got to school, like I was, the crosswalks in, in general, like I remember the crosswalks counted down from 30 and back where I'm home they count down from 10 and I was like what is this like it's gonna take me 30 seconds to get across the street and in a lot of places it does <laughs> right. so it was just like very strange and I remember the first time I I parked my car in the parking deck at USC I didn't have that skill where you're like okay let me remember what row I'm on you know and I I just parked my car and I went to class. And when I came back, I couldn't find my car. And me and my friends spent like four hours in the parking deck oh. looking for my car. And this is like a you know an eight-story parking I've been there. deck. I had no idea where my car was. That was like one of my first experiences out here. And, and people drive pretty fast too in that parking yeah, garage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can die in yeah. a parking garage. Oh, you can. Yeah, totally. in LA. Well, the second part of that question goes to the fact that these same people that were accepted that thought someone was playing a joke on them that they got in then they were in this setting where they were getting peer feedback mm -hmm. and they had never been through a process like that yeah. before yeah. and it was actually quite upsetting to them totally yeah 
<laughs> and it kind of broke people. Some of them, they said Absolutely. That. Yeah. I was just wondering without, maybe you could just talk in general terms, but how that was to get feedback. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird experience. So, uh, you know, and I, and I, and I say this all with love and, uh, stuff for USC cause it's, it's, it's my alma mater. Oh, sure. I love it. I love it with all my heart. Uh, but the, the feedback process, especially in film school is like unnerving in so many ways because it's almost like tearing down people's work is almost like sport there. Like, it's like, oh yeah, you think you're good? Well, check this out. And, you know, and, uh, and at the end of the day, it's all out of love, even though it's like really hard, harsh love. Uh, it's all to make the work better. But I mean, coming from me, I, I, ne I never really experienced that before. And I remember the first time we played my, my dailies, there was a room of like 50 people in it. And I, I'll never forget this. Uh, <laughs> This, uh, this one, the first comment that, that I got, somebody raised their hand and said, it doesn't look like this movie was directed by anybody. And I was like, oh, no. oh, oh yeah, oh, that's what I'm in for. And, uh, and the funny part was like, they were kind of right because like I, I, you just couldn't tell any intention in my work at the time, you know? Uh, but like, that was like the tone of, of how rough the notes process would be um, moving forward throughout school. And, uh, but at the, what's, what's weird is like, uh, after that class, I actually went and I cried in the, in the courtyard. I, I went and I was like, uh, I'll be right back guys. And I went and I wept and I wept bitterly. And I had a moment after I wept and I realized, oh, I'm still here. I'm still here, I can try again. And it seemed like that process, sort of, it, it, it sharpened me, if you will. And now I, I absolutely love people's feedback on my work, I, I, I love it. And now when people, and I've had this, I've had uh, with, my, with my first feature, I've had people uh, literally walk up to me and say, uh, this is the worst movie I've ever seen. I'm like, okay, that's fine. And it, it doesn't really bother me anymore because like, I know my work ethic, I know uh, my intentions as a director, I know what I'm trying to do. So uh, it, it helped me in the long run. And, and now actually I, I love it because I think the, the notes process, the uh, feedback process only sharpens your work and makes it better if you know what your intention behind the work is. So I love it now. Well, I know you said that you appreciate USC, and, and I get it because the people in the documentary, they also said that the, their school, they still have nothing but respect for, mm -hmm. but it was a very excruciating process. And one of the teachers even said, well, if you think this is difficult, try being out in the real world. For so sure. it was like this sort of like breeding ground, like, okay, who's going to make it, who's not? Yeah, yeah. And some people didn't make it. And I was wondering how that was for you, because it sounds like you have a very supportive family and you came from a supportive um, college where you had your four-year degree? Or? Yeah, four-year degree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how, what advice would you give to someone that's coming here that they know that this is just part of what they have to go through? It's not intentional. They're not yeah. trying to be mean, but... Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, my advice, I, I think, would just be to not quit because it's super easy to get discouraged and to feel bitter and to feel like, oh, these people don't get me. They don't, you know, and stuff like that. But the the great part is that like it does it does force you to examine what you're doing to examine your intention in your work and to sharpen it so it's the clearest most precise version of what you're trying to do and uh and when you when you realize uh like when you when you take your ego out of the process and you and you go into a note session thinking like okay i'm just here to get information that information is so i can improve my work it's not not going there to get validation that you're that you're good at what you do. Uh, it's it's not that's not what that process is for. This is like a process of of like whittling, you know, whittling a a, a stick into something sharp, you know. Uh, and then when you're done with that whittling process, then you can you can sort of release it into the world and have it be uh, something that you're proud of, hopefully. And and that process is so critical because I. When I think about how I used to work as an artist, uh, as a creator before my film school experience, I would just like 
you know, if I was gonna make a, a short, which I made a short before I went to school, and I made one cut and that was it. I was like, oh cool, I'm done. Like I, cause it's right there, I did it, you know? But then like, you realize that like, in film school, that's where you begin. That's where the work starts, is on your first try. On your first try where you thought you, you crushed it, and you realize, oh, I actually didn't crush it at all. <laughs> and that, that sense of uh, kind of humility that comes with the craft is like a really beautiful place to be in. At, at least I, I feel that way. And um, just, I, I, I now love that process. And, uh, but it's unfortunate, I actually saw some of my friends uh, didn't make it through the program. Like, uh, because like they, they were getting so much harsh feedback, I think they thought they started to take it personally and they started to think like, well, nobody gets what I'm doing. And so they dropped out of the program. And that's really unfortunate. Um, I mean, like, I, I'm not saying that, that staying in, everybody has their own path, so maybe that was best for them. But when I wanted to quit, I'm really, really, really grateful that I didn't. Because it would have, if I would have quit, like right after that note session where I, where I wept bitterly, um, I would have relieved myself of some short-term pain but I, I wouldn't be nearly the filmmaker that I am right now. And, and the great part also about the notes process is it, it sort of, it keeps you humble in the sense that you realize that, that there's so much that you don't know and there's so much to be explored um, that like the, the journey of becoming quote, a good filmmaker or a good writer is a lifelong process. And wherever we are in the process, that's just where you are. And I'm grateful that like, I feel like I'm, I'm like just now to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna try something new and I might fail, but uh, I've, I've gotten through failure before and I'm still here. So I know that I can get through it. When I go to your website for your film, Then There Was Joe, I noticed you have a ton of press from your hometown mm -hmm. from, or from surrounding areas and they seem so welcoming of you. How is that then to, to know that, yes, when you come to your new home in LA, it's a different ball game and yeah. that it's not personal, but it's just there's so many people doing the same thing. But, totally. So to be so embraced yeah. and, and, and cheered on and then coming back here knowing that you have to be your own cheerleader, really. Absolutely, yeah. So what's, what's interesting about, and like this was, like, was kind of my strategy actually, uh, for making my first film. I wanted to do it in a place where I would be like supported. And because the the crazy part is that kind of anywhere outside of, of LA, um, outside of California, if you make a movie, like that's newsworthy, you know? Right. Because it's just not a normal thing that a lot of people do. But out here in LA, everybody's making a movie. Like it's, and, and you know, I. I hate to use, like, use the term everybody, but a whole lot of people are making stuff out here to the point where it's, it's relatively normalized. And uh, like for instance, I, I'm, whenever I go to a coffee shop to just get a cup of coffee, if you just look at people's laptops, n nine out of 10 screens, someone's writing a screenplay. <laughs> and that is like not normal uh, anywhere else <laughs> kind of outside of, of LA. And so uh, it was amazing. Um, we, pr we premiered my film, uh, Then There Was Joe, uh, with the Arkansas Cinema Society, which is like put on by Jeff Nichols, who directed Mud and Midnight Special and stuff like that. So it was great because like they, uh, they saw my film and, and believed in it. And so they were like, we're gonna put on a, basically a premiere for it. And there was just a, a level of excitement that I just haven't experienced uh, kind of anywhere else uh, because it was it was a bit of like a hometown hero kind of vibe to it, um, but also like people just truly went to the movies to enjoy themselves. And I think sometimes out here in LA we can go to the movies to judge, like that's why we go. Oh yeah. Of like mm -hmm. we we walk in and we're like this better impress me, <laughs> and but uh, back home in in Arkansas people like they're just like it was almost like a magic like you walk into this dark room with all these strangers, and it's like, okay, what's gonna happen? And, and being in that posture, uh, about to watch a film, it's like a totally different vibe. And I think that 
actually most of the world experiences movies that way of a, I want to go and I want to be entertained and I want to be moved and I want to have fun. And uh, sometimes living out here in LA can be easy to lose track of that because sometimes we can try to just impress our filmmaker friends by like, do you see that dope shot and that thing that was tight, right? <laughs> and, uh, but like I knew that, that the film I was making in particular uh, is for like an audience to consume. And it's for people who uh, live, uh, live lives outside of the entertainment industry. Uh, it's about regular people going through what they're doing and, uh, and there's redemption at the end. And I know, you know, sometimes uh, like when I'm shooting my scripts to friends or they shoot me, uh, there are scripts like, you know, there's a, I think it was like George Lucas or somebody that said like, there's only like seven plots. There's only seven plots in the world or something like that. And like, there's some truth to that, I think, like, but the just just like how you can kind of only make a car kind of like one way really you know it's like it usually has four wheels it sometimes doesn't have to have four wheels you can make a car with three wheels i'm sure uh but like the reality is that like uh i think the majority of people um usually will give a movie a chance in ways that Sometimes, like after you've gone through film school, you've already decided, like, uh, I already, I've already seen this before because I know where this is going, and you're way ahead of the movie. And some, and you know, you can get into that habit and kind of stop enjoying films. And so, what, what making my my feature kind of taught me is it helped me remember what movies are for and what they do and what they mean to me. And seeing that in Arkansas was just a beautiful, beautiful experience and it rejuvenated me and it made me want to keep going. Because I, I got really scared after I finished my film because I was so tired, I was so exhausted that I was, I had a moment where I was like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. Like I think I, think I might be one and done. And uh, something happened when the lights went down and everybody got quiet and my, uh, my movie's a, a comedy drama, it's a dramedy, if you will. But the, the first couple title cards is a joke. And it takes you a second to get it, because it, it starts and then there's another title card and then another and then another. And everybody immediately busted out laughing. And I was like, ah, oh, got them. Ah, oh, they're in, they get it, they get it. And uh, I showed that to a lot of my friends out here and they were like, this is dumb. <laughs> really dumb oh my god <laughs> but i knew it was funny you know and and so i've uh that's another thing it's taught me uh this whole process is just like trusting your voice and knowing that your voice and your opinion of of things how you feel about something is totally valid and even if it's standing outside of a group of people and a group of people don't agree if you feel strongly about something, there's probably at least a million other people in the world that feel the same way. And um, this process, the notes process that we were talking about earlier, also like just helped me uh, know when to trust my voice. I think you, you said your family has this unofficial rule. I saw this in one of the interviews uh -huh. that you did. I'm taking this from the paper, but if you're afraid of something, that uh, that will make you a stronger, better person. That's probably the thing you need to do. Right. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Because like I, I think fear is a really good indicator. It's an indicator of perhaps like your your destiny in a weird way. I don't want to get too new agey in here, but uh, <laughs> oh, well, let me turn off the incense. Hang on a second. Okay. <laughs> but to me, in my brain, I feel like uh, like there's a better side of you on the other side of fear. Because uh, like things that I'm not afraid of are, are things usually don't they don't mean that much to me you know I'm usually afraid of the things that mean the most to me you know I'm I'm uh, like right before we we launched my the Kickstarter for my film like I had never experienced that much fear in my whole life because I was like oh my gosh this is public if I fail it's gonna be public everyone's gonna know about it and uh, like I hesitated for a while. And so there was like a week where I didn't post it. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this right now. And uh, like I thankfully, like my, my, I have a really supportive family, a really supportive wife. And, and they were just like, you have to do this. Like you have to, it's your destiny, if you will. <laughs> 
And, uh, and, I, and I've noticed that every single time where I've been utterly terrified and I've pushed through it, I've, I've only succeeded. And I don't mean that in like an arrogant way. I mean that in the sense of like, I jumped off the cliff and suddenly a trampoline appeared right before I smacked the ground. And that has happened so many times. And, and I think uh, for anyone who's put together a feature film, like, like you guys, um, you, you understand that. You know that like those things happen. You kind of move before any of the pieces are in place and suddenly magically the pieces are in place. And I've, I now love that feeling. I love sort of jumping off to see like, okay, am I gonna, is something gonna catch me? And nine times out of 10, it does. And when it doesn't, I'll, I'll figure it out. And that's just been a, that's been a recurring theme throughout my whole life. It's just, if you're afraid of it, you have to do it. So I'm taking a quote that you have here. I'm at my best when I'm telling extremely personal stories. Mm -hmm. Would you say you're an open book? You're okay with people knowing things about you? Absolutely, yeah. I, I like to, uh, in fact, I, I try to challenge myself to be even more open. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm as open as I need to be. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is like, I, I've always had like sort of an outsider perspective growing up and I've always felt like uh, I have a reservoir of almost like pain <laughs> and truth from which to draw from. And I've noticed that like whenever I'm telling stories that aren't very personal, there's like something kind of missing about it. Um, there's like, there's like, it's almost like an athlete in the fourth quarter who doesn't have their legs under them, you know what I mean, to, to shoot a jump shot. But I notice that when I, when I really lean into my truth and I lean into the things that mean a lot to me and uh, lean into the things that have value and things I can talk about at length and just kind of keep, keep going on and seem to never really run out of energy, those are my best stories that, that I tell. And, uh, I also think there's something to be said about, because a professor of mine, uh, when I was at school, uh, I think his name, uh, it's uh, Vincent Robert said this to me. He said, why do we tell stories? And he asked that one day and, and everybody in class was like raising their hands saying all these different things. And we were all wrong. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 we tell stories to heal. That's why we tell stories. And I had a moment where I, I almost couldn't breathe because I realized he was totally right, at least for me. I realized that's why I tell stories because there's something about opening up an old wound, trying to heal it in a way where other people can see it that absolutely heals them too. At least that's what I've experienced. So like in, in, in my film, my film is all about these two strangers who are actually brothers who learn to become brothers. That's what the whole movie's about. And uh, it's based on like a true story of, of my actual extremely broken relationship with my older brother. And, you know, we, we both grew up like total opposites. Um, like he, I, I was uh, very much a, a private school, try to make straight A's kind of kid. And, and my other brother, uh, like basically, uh, hung out in the streets and, you know, had a very vibrant, very successful life in crime. And uh, I just didn't understand it. I didn't get it. And uh, it hurt me for so, so, so many years. And I knew that like, oh man, if I, t if I tell a story about that and I can like, I can uh, make fun of myself, make fun of all the things that, that are, uh, all, basically make light of all the things that cause me pain, I know for a fact there's gonna be other people out there that are experiencing something similar that can relate to it. Because a lot of times when you're super specific about the things that, that cause you pain, uh, you can achieve almost like a universal sense of connection with other people. Because other people can see themselves in very specific stories. And I knew that. And that, that was something that I, I learned throughout school. And so like, I, I've noticed that every single time I do that every single time I'm, I'm honest and I'm open. I usually connect with way more people than if I tried to be someone else or tried to tell someone else a story that didn't fit 
uh, me. I didn't, I didn't have like a, I always have to find like an emotional in that moves me deeply to my core, something I can speak about at length. And when that happens, whenever I know sort of thematically why I'm telling the story, then I can, I feel like I could make a 10 hour movie about it, you know? Um, but yeah, so I, I always try to tell stories that are extremely personal and try to be as open as possible about it. And I'm trying to be even more open about the, uh, just the process of what it takes to put a movie together and the pain that goes with that too. <laughs> Yeah, I think people respect that honesty because a lot of us don't show different things. We just want to put, oh, no, everything's great. I got this kind of, you know, that's mm -hmm. become this new term. And I feel like we've become a society of like, totally. I got this. I'm yeah. good. And I'm not, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and the reality is like human beings, we are created for community. Like we're not really created. I, I know our society is very individual, you know, uh, we celebrate the individual, like the, the accomplishments of the individual, like I did this, I'm awesome, you know? And, you know, there's there's something to that uh, about like living up to your potential as a, as a person, as a, as a creator, whatever it is that you're doing. But um, I think when we deny the fact that we need to connect with other people, we do ourselves and everyone around us a disservice. Because something magical happens when when people open up to each other and you sort of take a risk and you learn to trust another person, something kind of beautiful happens in that. And uh, I think in today's day and age, like it's very easy to like open up Instagram and look around and be like, man, everybody's crushing it but me. <laughs> and in the reality, like we're all super broken people. Like all of us are broken. There's not one person on this planet that's not broken. And when you can sort of embrace that, you embrace a part of your humanity. And I feel like if you deny that, suddenly you're you're trying you're running away from the from basically your own fingerprints, the thing that, the things that make you uniquely you. And I think the more you embrace your faults, your weaknesses, and uh, and even your strengths, because sometimes there can be shame involved in embracing your own strengths. Just embracing who you are, the the good and the bad only makes you a more uh, valuable contributing member of society. How does it feel to come here um, and, and want to tell stories? You came from a, a town where it was very embracing and you have a, a warm family that welcomes you, but do you feel um, a sense of, of like freedom well now I can tell other new stories or is it scarier or how is that because it seems like maybe people really knew you back mm -hmm. home yeah. and and now not saying that people don't know you but it's there's so many people here yeah that it's different so how is that is that freeing is it scary is it kind of both or I think it's a bit of both um, I think uh, the only thing that I think uh, this entire process has has taught me is that uh, to not have shame in telling stories that excite you, that might, because there, there are some stories that I know for a fact that my mother would hate it if I told that story, you know? <laughs> uh -huh. Or if like, oh, if I put that scene in a movie, my mom's gonna kill me, you know? <laughs> um, but like, I, I'm now to the point where, like, yes, I do know that there are a lot of stories in me that I, I'm confident will probably make someone mad, or, uh, you know, who perhaps like my, my other films and things like that. But uh, the reality is that, like, we're all constantly evolving as people. And, um, you know, just because something makes someone uncomfortable doesn't mean there's not truth in it. Because a lot of times, I mean, I mean, we just right now in our society, like, we all, we're all running from the truth <laughs> about a lot of things because it makes us uncomfortable. And uh, I think, like, as long as I can find and tell stories that I feel are, are authentic to me, where I can lean into truth and embrace it, lean into pain and embrace it, then uh, I'm going to, as much as possible, aggressively pursue those types of stories. And I'm, I think one thing about, uh, perhaps like ever since, ever since I finished my, my feature, um, I think I've really, begun to realize like you know just how much effort it takes t to make a film and how much how much craft and and work and sweat and 
all these different things it takes to craft a story to where someone else can enjoy sure. it and, mm-hmm. and get what it is you're trying to do. That now, um, like for instance, my, my films moving forward, like I'm gonna make them even more, I'm gonna try my best to make them even more honest and even more mm-hmm. uh, like, embrace like the parts of me that are in the movie more. Because right, right. with as much effort as you put into these things, like you might as well make them as potent and as sharp and as resonant emotionally as possible. So, yeah. Why did you feel you need to tell this personal story? What, why was it so important to you? Because I knew that I needed to uh, learn how to forgive. <laughs> that's that's basically as uh, as simple as it as it. Uh, as it as can be really because like my uh i i think for the majority of my adult life i've harbored lots of like really mean unfair feelings against my brother and it's really only been i think really actually it's it's kind of timed up perfectly with the making of this film because now like for instance before the movie uh we rarely ever talked and I probably saw my brother maybe like once a year, maybe, maybe. And that was on holidays and that was just for the free food. That's all it was for. And, uh, and I, I knew that I wanted to try to forgive him. And I wanted to also try to forgive myself for not forgiving him. It's like this weird inception like mind trick. But basically I, uh, I came out of film school and I was like, I really wanna make a feature. Uh, what's the most potent topic I can make a feature about in my life? And I tried to write, I, I wrote all these other scripts, but I realized I was mostly running away from wanting to talk about my brother. And so uh, the whole thing was originally designed because like what I wanted to happen, and this would have been so great, it was, I, I get a kick out of it, but uh, what, what was supposed to happen is I was gonna write a script and I was gonna play myself in the script and my brother was gonna play himself. And because I wrote it, I could make him say things to me and I could say things to him. And together, throughout this process, we could learn to forgive each other and hopefully maybe salvage a little bit of a, of a relationship out of it. That was, the, that was the whole point. And what was, what was crazy is almost like down to the, to the, to the day, uh, like I started writing the script and I was talking to my brother And my brother and I, for the first time, started talking about things. I would ask him, like, hey, so why did you used to do that growing up? Or why were you never here? What what were you doing? And he kind of opened up to me, and he would start telling me these things. I would take those things and uh, kind of craft them into a character, into the script, and things like that. And, And throughout the writing process, we talked more than we'd ever talked before. And almost like clockwork, the day that I finished the script, I I picked up the phone to call him, and his number was disconnected. And I was like, what's going on? And so I called my mom and my mom was like, oh, you haven't heard? Uh, He went on the run from the police. And so he just disappeared. And so I was like, oh man, okay, wow. And it was weird because I kind of knew it would happen. Like I I knew that us talking consistently wasn't something that was probably gonna continue to happen at this point in our our relationship. And before I knew it, uh, he was gone. And so we went and made the movie uh, kind of in a more, I don't want to say legit, because it's like extremely micro budget, but, uh, but um, we you know, hired actors and like suddenly it was going to be a thing. And before that, it was just going to be basically me and him and like a DP, and that's it. That's what, that was what the whole thing was designed to do. And uh, what was wild though is like uh, after we finished, it was almost like, it was almost like we almost synced up in this weird way like we weren't in in connection but like when when our movie got into post-production like at one point all of our financing fell through and so i was doing post just by myself it was like me and one of my friends doing post and so the movie like you know went to a crawl and while that happened like the while that happened like i found out my brother was he he gotten caught and he went to prison And so it was weird because I felt like I was trapped in post when my brother was trapped in prison. (laughs) That's that's what it felt like. And then the craziest thing happened. Um, At one point, uh, like the financial the financial end got taken care of in terms of post, and then suddenly things sped up again. And around that time, 
my brother got released early from prison on a work release program. And so he basically got out of prison and then he was sort of in this sort of incubating period where all he had to do was, uh, was uh, he had to get a job and he had to report to uh, certain uh, parole officers and things like that. And so like, we, I finished the movie almost exactly around the time he got out of, out of prison. And what was fascinating is like, because he had gone through this really rough experience and I had gone through a creatively rough experience, we both kind of met up again and like our relationship kind of picked up right, right where it left off and it was beautiful. And he saw the movie and he saw himself in the movie and saw how I felt about him in the movie and like we cried about it. And like, and since then, this is like what, seven months later, we text every day, we call each other every other day and we talk frequently and my brother now, uh, like he's completely turned his life around. He's got a he's got a great job, and you know he's being a father to his children, and it's a beautiful thing. And I I really do think that that our whole family coming together to tell the story of uh, that is my feature. Then there was Joe. I think that truly healed my family, and I can I can say that unequivocally. Like I mean, it totally brought my family together in a beautiful way. And so I, I do know at least the power of movies to at least heal my family. And that's a real thing. And that was a very uh, beautiful thing that I don't think could have been planned. It just happened sort of serendipitously. And it was beautiful. And so I do know like firsthand that that's why I tell stories. I tell them to heal. I know you, you said you screened the film at the Arkansas Cinema Society, mm -hmm. and was your brother there? He was. It was amazing because it, we weren't sure if he was gonna be able to, to make it. He actually had to get like, you know, permission to actually show up and do it. But he was there, he was in the second row, and uh, that, it wasn't the first time he had seen it because we, uh, we watched it together before that. But, he was there and it was it was amazing because he was laughing almost harder than anyone else was laughing in the movie <laughs> which was great and then afterwards like it was amazing because the Ray Grady who's the actor that plays my brother who was phenomenal in the movie got to meet my actual brother and it was an amazing experience seeing both of them together because like I cast Ray Grady because the essence of Ray Grady reminded me more of my brother than any other human being I'd ever met in my whole life. And so to see both of them together was mind blowing. It was awesome. It was incredible. And uh, they were like kindred spirits. They were like joking and, and like they had always been friends. It was amazing. It was a really cool experience. When you approached your brother about writing a film about your family, how did he take that? Yes. So what's funny is like, I actually think I get my openness, I get a piece of it from my brother as well. So my brother's never been shy about his lifestyle. In fact, he kind of flaunts it. And that was kind of a way to him to sort of exhibit his power. Like he would come home sometimes, uh, you know, and would just not hide like what I've, where I've been, what I've been doing. And he would just kind of like be like, yeah, I was over at such and such's house and we were doing this. And you know, my mom would gasp. She's like, what, what? You know, and he would like kind of like grovel in that to some degree, you know? And so uh, when I was like, hey, I wanna, I wanna make a movie kind of about us. He was like, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so he was totally down with it, uh, which is like, so it, and, and like really encouraged me to go for it. And it's funny now, I feel like I, I didn't push the film far enough in a lot of, in a lot of areas. Uh, like there were, there were lots of things that I was like, oh man, is this too much? I think this is too much. And, and my brother would, would uh, I'd tell him like, hey, I'm gonna put this in the movie. He's like, yeah, so? He's like, you, like, you need to push that. And I'd be like, no, I already feel like that's, that's kind of a lot already. And uh, you know, so, so the actual like, uh, back and forth process like that like he was totally down with it like I didn't have to feel like I had to like win him over or anything like he was really really uh, rooting for me which was crazy because it was kind of the first time I felt in my life 
Uh, I'm sure he's rooted for me in other areas of my life, but in this particular arena, I felt more than ever that he was cheering for me. And I think that kind of opened me up to him even more to be like, oh, well, he wants me to do this. He supports me in doing this. And I think that was like a little doorway into uh, the healing process. When you made that phone call and the number was changed, mm -hmm. what was that day like? It's weird. I, I almost felt like I was expecting it. And, and the reason why I say that is because like I've, I sometimes can uh, have a, a tendency to be very cynical <laughs> and be extremely pessimistic sometimes. And I, every single time I'd get off the phone with him, I'd be like, that's probably the last time I'm talking to him. I don't know when I'm talking to him again. And whenever I'd call him and he would answer, I would be shocked. I'd be amazed. I'm like, oh my God, he picked up the phone. He answered my call. Because that historically has never been the case, ever, from anything that we've done. And so I, I was just like, eh, one of these days, one of these days I'm going to call and he's not going to pick up. Or one of these days I'm going to call, he's going to say, don't ever talk to me again. I don't know, maybe. Uh, or something. But So when it happened, I was kind of ready for it. And it didn't really shock me that much. But I was sad. I was sad because like during that, uh, probably like, that probably like six month process of talking to him back and forth was the most I'd ever talked to him. So it was, it was really cool in that regard because we we're actually starting to like develop a rapport and uh, it kind of felt like we were brothers for a little bit, which was really great. And then that was kind of like suddenly not in my life. And it was painful, but, but I think for the most part I, I was prepared. <laughs> So did you kind of have this thing in the back of your mind that, well, then maybe I'll hire actors? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Because also that there were a lot of things that I was, I was, as we kept kind of getting closer to, to the script getting done and actually thinking about the logistics of making a film, because I think a lot of people, if you're not, if you don't work in film, you don't realize how long the hours are and just how like crazy it is a lot of times to shoot a film. And so, you know, my, my brother at the time wasn't exactly totally reliable. <laughs> so, you know, to have him show up 12 hours a day to shoot something, 10 hours a day, however many long uh, we would shoot for, uh, m would have been a stretch for him. It would have been a big challenge for him. And so we were, I was about to start pivoting the conversation to that about like, hey, you know, if we do this and like, I have friends come over to shoot this, like you've you got to show up. <laughs> you actually have to be there for that and, and like for a really long time. And, you know, like it, it would be really great if you don't leave in the middle of it to go do something else and come back whenever you feel like it. Like it's, it's, it's going to be pretty hardcore. And uh, I was about to have that conversation with him and that's around when like we, uh, we lost touch. And so I kind of knew at some point that like, I knew I would be casting other characters anyway, and so the idea of casting him, um, I did like at the time I was bummed that I would have to do that, but I'm really really glad that we ended up doing it that way in so many ways because I think that my brother seeing the film pretty much totally objectively, like another person being him, actually allowed the allowed the movie to do more of what it was designed to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if you're in it, it's it's easy just to look at you in the movie. But if there's someone else portraying you in the movie, it's a totally different experience. It's removed. And so I think he got to experience it that way. Like he's like, oh, that guy portrays me. That's not me. That's a guy portraying me. And that character is written by that guy. So that must be what he thinks of me. And that's, you know what I mean? And so right. it was like a, a really fascinating experience and I wouldn't change it at all now because uh, I think it worked out great. Um, and like, uh, like I said, Ray Grady, who, pray, who plays my, who plays a version of my brother in the movie, like we kind of became brothers while we were shooting the film. And, um, you know, uh, we have a very sort of like brotherly rapport. And that was, that was something like an unexpected gift from the, from the production and so that's something I wouldn't change but it was a uh, yeah I wouldn't change a thing it happened out, it turned out great
If you don't want to answer this, we can turn it off, but this wasn't the first time that a film crew had followed your family, or are you, right. are you okay? Oh, totally. about it? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't sure. So could, could you talk about that, um, th this film crew that, that followed your family? For yeah, you? yeah. So uh, about, uh, I guess it was, oh my God, almost 11 years ago now, um, in 2007, uh, my family was featured on CNN's Black in America. And so it was wild because that was like my family's first brush with like show business, if you will. <laughs> and so uh, CNN like sent uh, camera crews down and they followed my family around for uh, a few months actually. It was, it was pretty crazy. Like at one point, like there were, there were camera crews following me around in college, which was weird. It was weird. And at the time I had no babe skills. <laughs> But when you're walking you around that. and you got cameras around, <laughs> suddenly you're like, okay, yeah, oh, yeah. right, right? <laughs> and so um, <laughs> so that, that whole process was like really, uh, it was pretty fun actually. Um, but like there was, a, and there, there's a part in the documentary where it, where it brings that up, where it, like just the irony of the fact because my mother's a juvenile judge, uh, my dad was super high up in the school district in Arkansas. And my brother's an attorney, and I was at the time, uh, I would want to be a musician. That's what I wanted to do. So I was playing music and playing shows and stuff like that. And then suddenly you've got this this guy who, uh, you know, goes to prison uh, basically for, you know, uh, goes on trial for shooting somebody. You know, that's pretty wild. Um, pretty, it's like, how did that happen, you know? And so, uh, like, they, uh, that was kind of, I, I think actually in hindsight, I think that was kind of like the first instance where I was like, oh, that is pretty weird that, you know, like you've got these uh, pretty respectable, upstanding parents. Uh, they have three kids, two of them kind of go a more, uh, go this way and one of them goes like that way. And uh, that was kind of one of the first times where I, I realized that that situation was interesting or unique or there was potential there. And so... Uh, you know, I, I guess if CNN found it interesting, I was like, okay, I guess that might be interesting. So maybe I should look into that. And so, uh, so it is fascinating, like years later, to kind of look um, and realize, like, oh yeah, that thing that they were kind of, the kind of uh, that resonated with them, uh, you know, has has been my story my whole life. And I, that was the first time where I kind of realized, like, oh, that is pretty different. That's like a kind of a twist, something I could I could use. And, uh, you know, at the time it, it was weird too because my brother was in a, in a place where he wasn't open with, with that particular instance that occurred. Now he's pretty open about it and he'll talk about it. But at, I know at the time, uh, like all the controversy surrounding that because when that, uh, when my brother uh, basically shot someone in, in Arkansas, uh, he, he did not kill them, they didn't die. They're, uh, they're alive and well. Uh, they like that was like really controversial at the time in my small hometown where I'm from. And so at the time, he didn't want to talk about it at all. Uh, now he's he's fine to you know he, he's owned up to it and things like that. Like he's he's fine now. But uh, but at the time, I I remember there was a, a lot more tension in my family when we were filming the, the CNN thing than there was now, like when we shot, then there was Joe. Because at that point, uh, we, we kind of just knew that like, yeah, that, that's, that's, what, that's my brother's lifestyle, that's what he does. And so I was able to sort of see it more objectively, you know, 10 years later than at the time. Because at the time I was just mad at him. So, and sometimes when you're mad, it's really difficult to see anything objectively. I think when you're when you're angry, you can't see anything objectively. And so later on, uh, the anger I think turned more into just pain. And pain, to some extent, is more objective than than anger. I think because uh, you can have a wound, and you're like, man, this really hurts. Why does it hurt? But when you're angry, you're like, this hurts. I hate everything, you know. And that's really difficult to uh, to objectively begin the healing process when you're angry so yeah how many people saw that new story and how long was the piece that they did uh the piece was well i i know they did like three i think they did three segments they did like the black man uh the black family and then the black something else but my but my dad was basically this 
like the main subject in The Black Man. Uh, and that was the, I think the first one that ran, it was an hour piece that they ran. And the, uh, what was the other question? Oh, do you know how many people saw that? Um, it was, I know it was in the millions. Um, I don't know how many millions. I've heard, like, uh, my dad can sometimes embellish things. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and he said, I, I think he said, like, like, 25 million people had seen it. But I do know for a fact that, uh, that like, at one point uh, after it aired, we got a message from one of our family friends in Cairo. She was in Cairo and saw it on TV. Oh, and she wow. was like, I'm looking at your dad on TV in Cairo. And I was like, whoa. And that, that was one of the, the first times I was like, oh wait, people actually saw, like, people saw that? <laughs> you know, because in my brain, like, whenever, uh, I, I guess I always convince myself, it's like, oh, nobody's gonna see it, it's fine. You know, but like, I guess a lot of people did see it, which is pretty cool. So it's cool, and it, it's cool to have the camera, I'm sure, at your college. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that sounds pretty interesting. It was pretty but, neat. <laughs> yeah, I gotta admit, that, that does sound cool. But then some of that fades, I'm sure, after a while. Did you ever feel like, well, I kind of wish some of this would go away? Or were you okay with that because there was a, a deeper meaning for wanting to do it? Yeah, um, it actually like faded away pretty quickly. Um, like, I mean, it seemed like there was all this hoopla, and then it aired and it was over. And I was like, oh okay, back to our normal lives. And like, it didn't, I didn't feel like there was like, I know, I've never had a moment where I'm like, no, no cameras, please, no cameras. You know, like, <laughs> it's never happened. <laughs> and like, so, so basically like after it was over, it was just like, oh, okay, now everything's back to normal. And, um, which I think was good. I think that was a good thing. Cause like I, um, I think potentially as impressionable as I was, cause I'm, I'm 31 now and I was 21 then or I was about to turn 20, uh, I was about to turn 21. I think that if like the hoopla had continued, it may have gone to my head, maybe, I don't know. Uh, like just as impressionable as I was back then. But I'm, so I'm kind of glad it didn't, didn't seem to, like the buzz didn't continue for a really long time, so. But not just go to your head, I, I meant more like they know your personal story and oh. how, how is that because it's something you live with every day and your gotcha. family lives, but to know that you could be going to the mall and there could be like, oh my gosh, that's the guy that I saw on CNN. Yeah, what's, what's weird is like I, that, that doesn't really ever bother me and I, I don't know if I was just not born with that muscle in my brain, but like, you know, I, I guess my, my story being, being public doesn't really bother me because it's what happened, you know? Okay. Um, and I, I don't think CNN portrayed it in like a bad way. Sure, uh, it was yeah. very objective. It was very like factual. I'm like, well, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty right. It's what happened. So, uh, and like my, my, my family's never really been one to like try to hide things. It's like, yeah, it happened. And so uh, I've, I've always kind of, I think I got that mostly from, from my parents because my, you know, my, my mom has just been a public figure for, you know, 35 years. And so, like, uh, my family, at least in, in Arkansas, where I'm from, is, like, frequently in the paper and on the news and things like that. So, uh, you know, when some sort of controversy happens or something and it becomes public, like, we've always just been like, yeah, that, that happened. And, you know, this is what we can learn from it and this is how we move on. And so I guess, I guess when I'm talking about this now, I think it kind of primed me for, you know, making Then There Was Joe, because it's like, it was a, I know that there are some segments of my family that did not want me to tell a story about my family at all, because I, I do think, a, and, and you know, there's, there's some valid, there's some validity to it, like where, you know, uh, there's some shame sometimes associated with things, and, and if you're not over that shame, you don't want people, you know, shining lights and cameras on your shame, you know? Uh, but fortunately, I, I think that I was able to look at it pretty objectively, and so was my brother. And so when we actually made the film, it kind of felt, kind of felt like, yep, we're just like, we're just exercising our demons here. It's all we're doing, nothing to see, you know. And uh, I think that that was like the best way to to tell that story in particular. And it's 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 given me a lot of bravery to face other areas of my life that. I perhaps looked upon with shame to just be like, nope, we all have, we all have, uh, you know, there's one in every family type thing, you know, and like we all have pain, we all have brokenness, and if 
we can stand up and sort of like offer that to the world in a way where other people can experience it. Like I've, I've only found that good things happen with that. Do you ever get stuck? Do you ever get stuck? Sometimes. And I realize when I get stuck, it's because I'm afraid. That's usually the only reason I get stuck. Or I, I in, because a lot of times I think when, when we get stuck, uh, for me, wh wh when you said stuck, I thought uh, like just creatively stuck. And yeah, I think almost all the time, like when you're stuck, it's like an intersection of, of lack of information and fear. And those things cross and then that's stuck. And then for me, I've, I've noticed that like, there's this writing mentor that I, I love very dearly. His name is John Vorhaus. And he writes a lot of these books about creativity and like what that, you know, kind of like mentally what's going on in the brain of a creative. And almost uh, nine times out of 10 when you're stuck, it's because you are at an intersection of lack of information and fear. And so when I, when I get stuck and a lot of times like I, I, I try to be very like, almost like scientific about my writing process and I like to like measure my goals and like how many pages did I write today and things like that and I try to be very measurable about it so I can, because I love to feel progress. So whenever I don't feel progress, I, I have sort of a mini freak out and then I start to realize, oh, it's because I, for this creative problem, I don't have enough information or I'm scared. And so, and one of the best things to do to alleviate fear is to, at least for me, because I'm obsessive compulsive, I, uh, I make lists, so I list things. So for instance, like if I'm having a difficult time uh, figuring out what happens next in a, in a script of mine, I'll sit down and I'll think like, okay, well the answer is here, I just can't see it right now. So what I need to do is I need to study what is here and generate enough information to just dislodge something in my brain so I can move forward. So if it's like, you know, uh, if it's like, okay, I don't know how this guy gets, gets the lightsaber. He's got to get a lightsaber somehow. <laughs> okay. Well, where is he? He's in a, he's in a, he's in a building. Okay. What kind of building is it? It's an office building. Okay. Well, let's list everything that's in an office building until we figure out, oh, like, oh yeah, I didn't realize that office buildings have staplers in them. Maybe he could take the stapler and then staple this thing and then that dislodges that and then boom, the lightsaber pops out, boom, solved. That's a terrible example, but um, I've, I've taken that, that sort of problem solving uh, angle to getting unstuck and I've applied it to almost every uh, area of my life. So for instance, like there was, a, there was a time where I was like really frustrated because like I really wanted to get like more, uh, more screenings of my film on the books, right? And, uh, and then I had a moment where I was like, oh, well, I can just sit here and make a list of all the places in the world that might be interested in screening my movie. And you do that and you keep going and you will end up with a list that is absurd, absurdly long. And then that sort of starts to take away fear because I think fear comes from a, 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 a mindset of scarcity. And so, when you realize and you sort of take your eyes off of that and look at the abundance, there's opportunities, there are solutions, there are, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm a comedic filmmaker, so there are jokes, there are, all that is everywhere. It's everywhere and it's all just a matter of focus and attention. So if you're scared about something um, and there's no shame in being, a, uh, being afraid because fear is a very real thing. But what I try to do is I just try to take a systematic approach to alleviate my fear. I try to identify what it is, and then I try to solve it, like a, like a math problem. What word do you feel you use too much when you're writing and then you go back and you look at it and go, oh, I keep using that word. What word? Or words, many. Huh. Probably staggers. Oh, really? No, it's really random, but like, you know, when it comes to writing, like I'm very, uh, anal retentive about like which verbs I pick, you know, cause like strong verbs are visual and they're, they're active and you know, uh, a lot of times like that can eliminate the need for an adverb. So you just pick a really strong verb. So it'll be like Bob staggers into the room and stumbles over a couch. 
or something like that, you know? And then I'll go back, I'm like, I use staggers and stumbles a lot. I should probably like find another verb for that. I know it sounds really weird and really random, but like I've noticed that in a lot of my first drafts, I'll use the word staggers a lot. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I picture like John Wayne staggers out of the saloon, right? <laughs> throws a cigarette down and get me another whiskey or to something. To the howl of wind. <laughs> yeah. It was awesome. Interesting. Okay, so that seems to be a favorite word, but then you try to take it away because you see you use it too yeah, much. Yeah, I use it too much. Um, I also, uh, I probably, well, I don't, no, no, I don't know if you can, but like in, in screenwriting in particular, I like, I use so many double dashes, it's crazy. Um, and double dashes is not a word, but like, I, I feel like if you were to just find and replace double dashes, it would like probably make the computer explode. There's just too many of them. Um, but I like it because it like forces me to, you know, embrace white space and all that good stuff. But I, uh, but yeah, probably staggers. Interesting. What words do you feel are overused in writing today? Huh, overused. Uh, pretty but doesn't know it. Like that's a phrase, <laughs> not, not a particular word, but I, that's great. I, I think that phrase gets used a lot. Like mm -hmm. she's pretty but doesn't know it. It's like I don't know what that means. Like I don't I don't know what that means. And that's a very like male perspective of you know what I mean. But but I see that a lot in in that's scripts true. is pretty but doesn't know it. Um, a woman would say pretty but she's nice. Right, pretty but she's nice. Yeah 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 exactly. Uh, but yeah I, I I see that phrase used a lot. Um, you know I've I've actually tried to uh, in the last like. Uh, year or so make my scripts more conversational instead of more like writerly if that makes sense like the writerly in the sense of like the words are scrutinized of of like what words appear on the page and what words more importantly what words don't appear on the page but I try my best to like almost make it like Justin's telling you a story because you know a lot of times like the you know I hate to say this, but most people don't read anymore. You know what I mean? It's like really hard to get people to read uh, to read anything, even like your close friends. It's really hard to get people to read, and I get it. I get it because like we're we're all so busy with things that to actually carve and set aside long stretches of time, especially to read a screenplay that's like a hundred words, a hundred. I'm mean, sorry, a hundred pages, hundred and twenty pages sometimes, which is pretty long these days. So I try to make the the script as fun to read as possible. So so. If I'm fortunate enough and somebody sits down and reads my script, they're like, oh, it kind of felt like you were talking to me. And it kind of felt like a friend was telling you a story. So I've tried to do that more and I've, I've had a modicum of success with that. But I, uh, yeah. yeah. So when you say you, you try to make it less writerly, is that the dialogue? It, it was just, it's more like grunts, like, eh, yeah, it's okay. Instead of like, yes, I had a wonderful time. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I definitely try to make the, the dialogue because like, you know, I... There's some, there's a lot of different modes of thought of like, oh, a character should never repeat themselves or, you know, something like that. But the reality is people repeat themselves all the time. You know, uh, like in the middle of, of talking, like sometimes people can repeat themselves. And so like what I do a lot of times, is, and this is, comes from my, my theater degree, my theater background, is like I actually say the dialogue out loud and whatever I say that feels normal, I write that down. So if there are ums and ahs in it, and those ums and ahs feel natural and feel like that's how this per particular person would say it, I write them in it, into the actual dialogue. And I think that like if, you know, if I'm doing my job properly, it should feel like these are actual human beings talking because an actual human being said that. <laughs> you know, and I think sometimes when you become, uh, sometimes you can be too writerly in the sense that the dialogue can sometimes be too clean and too sterile to a degree where it feels like it's written instead of something that should be experienced, if that makes sense. So I've tried to like allow myself that freedom and that, uh, you know, I don't know if I've, I can say I've earned that luxury yet, but I, I feel that that works for me. Do you have a favorite dialogue scene in a movie that you just love the dialogue, it's just perfect? You know, some people say, well, Harry, when Harry met Sally, or, you yeah, know, yeah, whatever yeah. they have. Yeah, that's I'm great. I'm myself with that one, sorry. Um, oh, that's, that's, that's a really great question. Um, the Apartment is one of my favorite movies ever, ever made. And, uh, you know, the, I've always loved, there's like a scene where like uh, Jack Lennon and uh, Shirley MacLaine are like 
uh, he's putting on a bowler hat. And, th- and in that scene, there's a moment where he like flips, flips open this uh, compact and the compact is, is shattered. And because it's shattered, he knows that like, oh, that girl that I have a crush on, my boss also likes. And in that moment, and like the dialogue in that scene is so witty and so charming and so beautiful, but also it's heartbreaking because like he's still trying to, the second that he realizes that Shirley MacLaine, he probably can't have her in that moment, that's what he's feeling. He still like keeps his conversation like, you know, light and witty, but he's feeling pain while he's doing that. And I've always loved that scene in particular. Um, I also love the dialogue in uh, Boogie Nights. Boogie Nights is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, like, like there's a scene where like Don Cheadle is, is trying to sell this guy this, uh, this stereo system and he's got like this, this country twang and it's, it's amazing. It is so good. And uh, to me, though, like those characters just feel lived in, they feel real, they feel uh, very specific to what they are um, in the degree of like they are, uh, they're just memorable. And I really, really like stuff like that. So I don't know if that answered the question or not. But. Here is this lovely bag. Okay. Great. Cool. Awesome. I will uh, just pick one at random. Okay, great. By the way, where can we purchase this bag? Is this... Uh, my website, okay, 1999. <laughs> just kidding. It's my wife's makeup bag. <laughs> um, cool. This is from uh, Andre Sav. Chenko, I'm okay. sorry. I'm Hi. sorry. I know I butchered your, your name, Hi, uh, but I appreciate it, it, your question. Hi. Hi. What was the biggest obstacle on your way in the whole process, and how were you able to get through it? Thank you, Andy. Okay. Oh, so nice. Hi, Andy. It says Andre up here. Oh, it might be a typo. Okay, so it's Andy, Andy. Savchenko. Okay. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Hi, um, Andy. Thank you. What's the biggest obstacle on my way uh, in the whole process, and how were you able to get through it? Um, Surprisingly, I think like the, at least for me in, in, my, in my feature film, I think the biggest obstacle was really just fear. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's a, it's a very like, uh, that might sound like a cop-out answer, but it's, it's really not. I think the, the hardest part is like trusting yourself throughout the madness of everything that's going on. Um, like the, one of the biggest fears I had was just like trying to come up with the money for it because that was a really difficult process. Like we, we did a Kickstarter campaign and we raised $35,000 for it, uh, which um, was really, I think I had a little bit of beginner's luck because when I look back at it now, I kind of can't believe that we did that. It's pretty wild. Um, but like, I think the, the hardest part, it's, it's really the fear and also uh, the patience it takes to sort of do one of these things because things are never gonna move as fast as you want them to move. They're gonna move about, like, one of the things I realized is like, almost everything that I thought, I was like, yeah, I should have that done in a month. Uh, I just started multiplying it by four. So it'd be like, that should be done in a month, and it would take four months. Oh, wow. Because, uh, because working at this level, because uh, my film is a micro-budget film, um, you know, uh, it's basically like, you know, th- there's a there's like a that triangle, right? Like the good, fast, and cheap triangle. You can only have two of them. That is a real thing. That's totally a real thing. And so, if you don't have the money to do something, and you are having someone work on it, like, well, they're probably only going to work on it like when they have time to do so. And that means that you can get it good, but it's not going to be fast. <laughs> uh, and so, like, I I noticed that because like a, a lot of like I think we, we did like really, really great work on my film and the people, uh, like all the different disciplines did a great job, but it just took a really long time and I think that the, the patience can almost be enough to drive you mad. Um, like for instance, our, our, uh, our VFX guy, who's a brilliant VFX artist and he works at like this big VFX house, was basically working on my film um, at nights every other weekend because he had stuff to do and he just had a brand new kid and things like that so like that took a long time you know uh my my dear friend who's a sound designer uh did sound on my film uh but he was working on that throughout 
all, all of his different jobs. So that was a super slow process. So uh, I think just being prepared with how, with the patience, like how long it's gonna take, um, you'd be surprised, like, like waiting, waiting for something can drive you mad. Uh, especially if like, that is like your number one focus, which is, which is your feature or, or your project that you're working on, because it's only going to be, it's only going to burn with that level of intensity to you, the creator. <laughs> it's not going to burn with that same level of intensity to anybody else. And knowing that and embracing that can allow you to be cool with it. Um, and like I think earlier during the, the post-production process, like I didn't understand that. And that would, I would get angry and I would get like very impatient. And I would, I would be confused, like, why aren't they getting back to me? What's going on? Uh, uh, I can't take it, you know? And uh, which is just silly, you know? Uh, because the reality is that like anything that's, that is good takes time. You know, there's a, I think the quotes from like Alice in Wonderland, but there are no shortcuts to places worth going. That's a real thing, you know? Like, uh, we live in a culture where we want things, we want it now, and we want things instantly. But when it comes to making something like, like a feature or just any sort of long-term project, it just takes time. It takes time for the thing to, to develop. It takes time for the thing to marinate. And uh, the patience and getting through the fear of it are the two biggest obstacles, I'd say. So this question comes in from Michael Pythium. Hi, Michael, by the way. Thank you for your question. Definitely an awesome feat, but what drives you? Was it always a dream to be a filmmaker or was it something that fell into your lap one day? Yeah, I, I think it's somewhere in between those two things. Uh, I think I'm an, I'm an odd case <laughs> in the sense of like, I, I'd always grown up, like my, for instance, like, my, like when I was eight years old, my, my grandfather gave me a VHS camera. And so I had, the first movie I ever made was like, I, I made R2-D2 crawl across my, or roll across my kitchen table using uh, stop motion animation. That was the first movie I ever made when I was eight years old. And I, I pretty much always played with a camera growing up because I was pretty lonely and I didn't have a lot of friends. So I would stay at home on the weekends and I would make, uh, I would literally play, uh, I'd make little Star Wars films and I would play all the parts. I would, and, and I intuitively sort of understood of like, okay, well, I like, I would cut all the, everything in camera, because this was like before I had access to like Final Cut or anything like that. Um, so like I would like actually film like me as like a Sith Lord going like, don't, uh, you know, where are the rebels? And then I'd stop and then turn it and then I'd take the mask off and then go over here <laughs> and then be the, be the other side of the conversation, right? So that had always been in my life, but I never like wanted to be a filmmaker growing up. I just did it because that's, how I entertain myself. And then, um, you know, I went to, I went to college and in college I was, I was pretty hell bent on becoming an actor. That's really what I really wanted to do and a musician. I really wanted to do those two things. And so I ended up sort of, uh, at some point realizing like maybe I can fuse those two things together and figure out a way to use all these different interests into one thing. Because the thing I love about filmmaking is like, it's like so many different disciplines all married into one thing. And so uh, I wasn't ever really gonna pursue it really until I got into film school and I got into film school, like I was telling you earlier, like it, it kind of blindsided me. I didn't expect to get in, I didn't know, I didn't know anyone there. I didn't, you know, I, I like on, I feel like uh, on paper, there's no way I should have gotten into film school. There's just no way. And uh, so I sort of took that almost as like, you know, as this weird, it's gonna sound weird, but almost like divine, you know, intervention of like, you need to do this. And it's something I've always uh, been fascinated by. And so I went to film school basically because like, my school wouldn't allow anyone to defer. Like it's like a once in a lifetime chance. It's like, you're either in or you're not in. Uh, Cause I was gonna see like, maybe I can defer a year or something like that and that wasn't an option. And so I just jumped and, and did it. And uh, cause it sounded way better than working for a gas company. <laughs> so uh, 
I, I've done that and now I can't see my life without creating films. I, I can't see it. And so there was never really a moment where I was like, I want to be a filmmaker and this is what I'm going to do. It did kind of fall into my lap, but that's because I had all, it had always sort of been in the background in the way. It, you know, and, and movies were always a way that my family uh, bonded together. Like we speak in movie quotes to each other, you know. That's, that's my family. My dad's a massive film buff. And so like, you know, Turner Classic Movies was always on when we were growing up. And I'd be like, Daddy, why are your movies in black and white and mine are in color? Like, what's <laughs> going on? I don't understand, you know. And like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's sort of been a natural progression. There was never a moment where I was like, oh, I am a filmmaker now. It's been a real slow burn for me to kind of get to this point. And, and now like, uh, writing scripts and, and making films kind of feels like breathing to me. Not in the sense of it's easy, it feels just natural. It feels like, oh, this is a, a, a thing I have to do because it's in me now, if that makes sense. It does. I was just wondering, with this job that was at the gas company, was it already lined up? I mean, no. You, oh, okay. No, no, I just it wasn't. wasn't sure. <laughs> no, no. It, it, it was basically me, uh, like, I would pass by, like, okay, I'm going to work there, and then we're going to, because this was when I was planning my wedding with my wife. I was like, okay, I'm going to work there, and then I'm going to have that house, and cool, we're going to settle down, we're going to have kids, and it's going to be awesome. And so that was my plan. Like, I was going to, I was, like, literally putting together a resume to submit to that gas company, because, like, I'm going to work there. And so that's, yeah, that's basically how that, how that worked out. Did you want to do theater on, on the side? You know, I, I've always, like, I love performing. It's great. But I, the actor's life, to me, is so brutal. And at that point in my life, I, I didn't think I was strong enough to do that, which is like to, to pick up and move to, uh, you know, if you want to do theater, a lot of times you pick up and move to New York, you know, and try to crash with your friends and try to make it. And at that point in my life, I just wasn't that bold to do that. Mm -hmm. And so for me, film school made sense because it's like, oh, well that's kind of like a safe place I can go. I can move to a new place and there's like structure and you know, I can learn about this thing because I, I'd always uh, fantasized about making a movie uh, and like what would that be like? What would that look like? And so getting to, because actually like uh, there was a point uh, right after I graduated from college where I told my mom, I was like, you know what, I, I kind of want to try to make a movie. And she was like, oh, well, what do you need for that? And, and I was like, well, I, I guess I need a camera. And she literally, and like this is a testament to how, how phenomenally blessed I am to have parents like this. My, my mom literally opened up her wallet and she handed me money and she was like, do you think that's enough? And I was like, I think so. And so I went and I Googled cameras and stuff like that. And I was like, I think I'm gonna buy that camera. And I never bought it. I never bought it because I realized I didn't know how. I didn't even know where to begin. And I didn't wanna take my parents' hard earned money and buy something and then never use it. I just didn't wanna do that. And so I ended up giving my, my mom her money back. So I just gave it back to her. I was like, thank you so much. Uh, cool, I don't think I'm gonna do that. And then later on, I ended up applying to film school. And when I got in, then I was like, oh, that makes sense. Like, now I can go and learn how to use a camera <laughs> and learn in my brain. That's, that's what I was thinking of like, oh, I can go there. I can go to a safe, structured environment, learn my discipline, learn my craft, and then come out and do something that I've always wanted to do. That's just sort of always kind of been in the background, if that makes sense. And so uh, the getting into film school, at least to me, um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying everybody needs to go to film school. It's, it's definitely different for every single person. Like there's some, some people who don't need it. Uh, me in particular, I feel like I needed it um, because I did. I, I wasn't bold enough just to pack out, uh, pack up my car and move to LA and just start making films. You know, I, I, I'm just not that personality. Sure. So it worked out. I, it worked out great for me so far. So far. <laughs> yeah, everybody has a different comfort level, I guess. Yeah, it. for sure, okay. definitely. Yeah. And some people, they only feel alive when they're like risking everything. Yeah, and they yeah. Have to and be they're in that place. Absolutely. And there's some people that are incredible at that. They're just amazing. Like, I, I have some friends that, that have done that, that just like literally dropped everything they were doing 
and they drove to LA with like 50 bucks in their pocket and they're like, I'm gonna make this work. And they have. Wow. I'm not that personality. I'm just like, nah, I need to know exactly how much it's gonna cost. I need to know, <laughs> you know, I need to know where I'm sleeping, you know. Sure. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I feel like the, uh, that spirit though, uh, the, the magic of movies and, and what stories can do, um, I think that's in all of us. And, you know, we all take different different paths to get there, but uh, my path doesn't, isn't gonna look like everybody else's path, but so far, like, uh, you know, it's only really in hindsight that you can look back and see that, oh, that did connect to that, and that connected to this. But when you're going through it, sometimes it can feel like chaos, but just in my, in my 31 years of living, when I look back at my life, I realize like every single moment in my life where I thought like, oh, that was the end, that end was always a beginning. And this always connected to that in a way that I couldn't see at the time. And now I'm, I feel like I'm just now getting to the point where I can just sort of like live my life and be like, oh, this is happening now? Okay. And just sort of go with it. Because I, I used to fight that all the time. I used to fight like, wait, but how does this fit into my dreams of working at a gas company? How does that fit into, you know? And at the time I would stress out about those things. But now like, I just try to, I don't want to get too new agey here, but you know, I try to just follow my, my bliss, you know, mm -hmm. of like, oh, this feels right. This feels right in my intuition. Uh, this is what I'm going to do now. And so far it's been working out all right. Well, before I sound the gong, um, do, do, you, do you ever think about, hey, like it's 11 o'clock here. If I was back home, it would be whatever, two, whatever. And I'd be looking out on a courtyard from my desk, you know, and I'd have structure and I'd have yeah. meetings and I'd have, yeah, and, yeah, I'd either be the boss or I'd have a boss to report to. Uh huh. And that could have been my reality. Not that that's a bad reality for some people. Right, some right, people, right. They, that's great. Absolutely. But do you ever think about that? I do sometimes think about like, uh, and, and it terrifies me. And it terrifies me not, not because like, uh, yeah, like those people are crazy. It's not like that. It's, it's like, I, even though like, Right now, I feel like I'm, I'm on my path, like with, without a doubt, I'm unquestionably on my path. And I think that that other path, at least for me, if I had done that other, that other type of life, it would have been uh, basically, um, it would have been in reaction to denying risk denying taking a risk. Whenever I, I have fleeting moments of thinking like what could have been, I know that that life, at least just for me, would have been uh, a byproduct of, of minimizing risk in my life, you know? Because like there are some people that go do that and that's what they're designed to do. That's what they're meant to do. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm not designed that way. Um, I am designed to do this. And, and the, the great part though is like, uh, even though like, you know, a career in film is unbelievably unpredictable and I'm just at the beginning of mine. So I'm, I'm still like trying to figure it out, but you know, it's been great because like I've learned to create a lot of structure in my life that has allowed me to be creatively productive and and has allowed uh, more sanity into my life, you know? Um, and I, I think I've, I, I can definitely take, because I, I call my brother, in fact, my, my brother called me the, the other day and he works a nine to five job and he was like, man, it must be nice to be able to do whatever you want. And I was like, I know it probably seems that way, but that's not the case. <laughs> it's a, there's a lot of uncertainty, you know? There's a lot of uh, lack of, lack of sometimes direction that you can feel, but I've, I've just like, I'm what, I'm four years out of school and I'm, ama first off, I'm amazed I'm still out here. Like every single day I'm like, man, I'm still out here. That's amazing. That's incredible. And, and, and it's all been by some beautiful design that I, I can't determine while I'm, while, it's, while I'm going through it, you know? Every single thing has led has perfectly led to the other thing, even in the times where it feels like I've gone through or I've been going through the desert without any water, you know? And so it's been uh, a really awesome experience so far, and I can't wait to see where it goes. <laughs>
And we're rolling with yep. sound. Okay, yep. great. We'll, we'll hand the bag to All you. Right. All right, great. Oops, sorry. Oh, that's okay. There we go. Okay, great. Okay, this is from, oh, uh, Smelter Sounds. Okay, hello. The itch for a project or idea, how it feels, why you can't stop thinking about it. It's a project that has to get done. What was the first project like that? What for you? was the first project yeah. like that? Man, there's a lot of projects like that, actually. Um, like I, I have a, I have a kind of like a hard drive of scripts that I like, I just desperately want to make. But the, the thing that I, I tried to do was find like the great intersection between that feeling that he's talking about, like the, the I desperately have to make this, I want this to exist, I, I'm ready to lay down on the train tracks to make this work. Um, that, uh, that feeling intersecting with like kind of like realistic resources of where I, of where I am right now. And so like, you know, I have, I have scripts that are like, you know, take place in fantasy worlds where like it would take phenomenal amounts of money to like build just the world, you know? Uh, and I, those are scripts I desperately want to make, but I'm just not at that level right now. So uh, the, the thing for me is like, it, it's kind of have to, it has to tick two boxes. It has to tick that feeling of just like, I have to make this and is this realistic for me to make? Because I think that one of the hardest things I, I learned is like the, the first movie, cause like then there was Joe, which is my feature, was actually the second script that I, that I landed on to, to wanna make after, after school. So I'd written an entire other feature that I was like, I'm gonna make this one. I'm totally gonna make this one. And I started to, uh, it was funny, I was, I was talking to a uh, producer friend of mine, not the producer of the movie, but a producer friend of mine. And uh, I was saying, like, I really wanna make this movie. Like, what do you think I should do? And they were like, first off, you should write a business plan. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh my gosh, no. Um, and they were like, and you should budget out the movie. So you know, like, realistically, if you can make this or not. And I like, was just like, ah, oh, man, that sounds pretty awful, but I'll do it anyway. So I sat down and like for like a couple weeks, I, I budgeted out this script. And I realized very quickly, like this is like a million dollar movie. And, and I, thought real, I thought just in terms of, perhaps cynically, I don't know if, if it's realistic is the way to put it, but cynically I thought, who would give me a million dollars to make a movie? Like who would do that? <laughs> and I was like, I don't, I don't think anybody would do that. And so I, I was like, okay, well I need to try and figure out something else. Um, like a way that I could like gather at least some amount of money because every movie costs some amount of money. It's not possible to make something with nothing. You have to have some amount of money. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna do everything I can to write something that has that feeling of like, I have to make this along with something that, uh, to where it is also cost effective. So I, uh, so then I wrote, then there was Joe thinking like, okay, I'm going to shoot this back home where I'm from. I'm going to shoot it in my parents' house, uh, where I grew up. I know for a fact that, uh, there's a guy down the street who owns this place. He'll probably let us shoot there for free, you know? And so that's what I was thinking in terms of like how to, how to get it made. And so, uh, if I tried to do that with the other film, I think I'd still be trying to make it. I'd still be trying to come up with the money. Like, because to be frank, I'm, you know, uh, like I'm still a first time filmmaker. Uh, like I just completed my first feature. I'm still like, who would give me money for my next one? I don't even know, <laughs> you know? And so uh, like, I'm still sort of in that mindset of like, okay, well, I know for a fact I wanna make something else. It has to, it has to resonate with me. And, it, and right now where I am, it has to be made in a way that is realistic. Like where I'm still gonna be calling in favors, most likely. I'm, uh, you know, I think for this, for my next film, I think I can get a, a larger sum of money, but not too much, you know? And, uh, and knowing that like, my, my goal eventually is just to like stair step my way into it, you know? Like each film just gets a little bit bigger than the last one, which is like, that's not too unreasonable, you know? If you go from, uh, I think sometimes, it's easy to think like, oh man, you know, I made this movie, now my next movie is gonna be a $30 million movie or something like that. 
And I, maybe I'm cynical, but I just think that's unrealistic. Maybe that happens for other people. Actually, it does happen for other people, but I don't know if it would happen for me. So uh, my, my goal is just to make, to make films that, that I feel like I have to make that are within a certain uh, contained, uh, that, are, that can be made in a relatively contained way. Uh, and what's great about that too right now is like, you know, I was, when I was thinking about that, that first script that I wanted to make that was like a million dollars, uh, now, in hindsight, I would never trust Justin two years ago with a million dollars. I would never do that because like, I just didn't have the chops then. I feel like now I could probably do that maybe, I think, you know? Uh, but like, it's, it's just one of those things where uh, I feel like, you know, filmmaking, especially like directing and writing is like, it's a process to get up to, to direct a big, a huge movie, you know? And I'm just gonna slowly kind of just march my way, hopefully up the stairs until eventually I'll get to direct something really big one day. But until then, um, yeah, I'm gonna keep trying to make films within my means that uh, scratch both of those uh, boxes. I think it's great that you you wouldn't be so tempted. I mean, who wouldn't want two million to make something? But right. I mean, so many people have overconfidence. I yeah. think sometimes, yeah, and yeah. it's kind of this this thing that's that's definitely like embraced. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great that it's that you want to take you want to kind of go to these next levels in a progression, not not just totally jump. To yeah, the, yeah. Because like I think if I were to just jump to a huge movie right now, like I I don't know how good that movie would be. You know, because like there's so many, you know, it's that whole thing like mo money, mo problems. Like that's kind of a real thing, you know. It's like, so uh, my my last movie was of a certain very small budget range. Uh, the next script that I that I wrote is like about twice that, but that but twice of a little is still not very much. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think I can handle that, and I think I can handle that and make something really solid with, in a very fiscally responsible way. And uh, you know, I I like that. I like growing. I I've actually learned to appreciate kind of slow growth, and slow progression, and being cool with that. Um, because I, like I was talking about earlier, it's really easy to want to just get there right now. It's like I want to direct, I want to direct the next Avengers movie right now. You know, you can really want that. Uh, but like, if we're realistic about it, like I wouldn't trust myself right now sure. at this particular spot in my career. I wouldn't trust myself with an Avengers movie. There's no way, <laughs> you know. And so, uh, and when I when I get there, when I get to the point where I can direct something like mm -hmm. that, like I want the experience and the resourcefulness to all line up, hopefully in a way that where right. synergy is occurring, where I can actually meet that uh, that opportunity and like do a good job with it. Next question. Cool. Oh, Here you great. go. Thanks. Okay, and this is from IGLP3. Hey there. Here's my question. Oh, my name is Chloe Villarreal. Hi, Chloe. How do you stay the course in spite of the inner negative narrative so many writers deal with that says everything you make sucks? Man, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a great oh. question. Oh, it's rich. Oh, it's really rich. Oh, man. You got us, Chloe. Oh, man. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, gosh, I feel like I can speak on this for days. Um, I, I would say, like, um, in particular, like, uh, I don't want to get too dark here, but, uh, but, I think writing is inherently like the only person you're battling is yourself really most of the time because uh, and I think in particular uh, at least for me I can only speak to my experience but I, I struggle a lot with like self-hatred like I, I there's lots of parts of myself that I hate and uh, I'm only sort of just now getting over a lot of these types of things but like when it's just you and a blank screen and a cursor flashing Sometimes like all of your insecurities and things just bubble up and it gets in the way of you of you Getting your creative thoughts onto the page and I've learned just for me like when I'm able to give myself permission to write the worst most terrible pages of all time Then I can do it and Then I know in my uh, like in my back pocket. I know that writing is a process 
So I know that like whatever I try on my first attempt is probably not going to be very good. In fact, like, you know, the, the terrible first draft is like, that's just kind of a law in how I see it. There are other people who I'm sure are, are brilliant that can pump out a genius first draft. I am not that person. I will never be that person. And so for me, um, when I'm allowed to give myself grace and allow myself to write terribly, to just write things that don't make sense, to write sentence fragments, to write, and then they fight, I'll come back later and then keep going, you know what I mean? Like when I allow myself that sort of level of freedom, then I can write. And I feel like on paper, I shouldn't be a writer because I'm like my self-criticism in my brain is pretty fierce and sometimes it's unbearable. But I think that you, you do, you have to give yourself grace and you have to like, again, I don't wanna to be too new agey, but you gotta like <laughs> kinda of love yourself. You know what I mean? You have to be okay with, yep, these are some terrible words, but you know they're words and that's all that matters right now. In this particular instance, the only thing that matters is like I'm putting words onto the page. They don't have to be the right words, they don't have to be in the right order, but they're words. And for, at least for a first draft, that's the, that's the thing that I think when I learned that, sort of like, you know, unlocked in my brain, I'm just like, oh, this draft doesn't count. It doesn't count, because I'm gonna, I can go back and fix it later. Um, and so writing with a, a reckless abandon of like, this doesn't have to be good. This is supposed to be bad. Anyone can write a terrible thing, you know what I mean? Uh, terrible just in terms of the mechanics of the words. Like anybody can write something terrible, you know? And like, that's how I find my entry into it. It's like, if I, I know for a fact that I can write something terrible. If my goal is to sit down and be a genius, I can't hit that every day. But I can hit being really bad every day. And so that's my only uh, metric of success is like, are there words on the page? Yes. I don't, my metric of success is not, are they good words? Is this good? That's for, that's for later. I'm not sure if I've mentioned this before, but there's this thing called the Dunning-Kruger effect, mm -hmm. and I'm probably butchering the name of it, but I think it's something to the effect of those who think that they're really horrible at something are actually better than maybe most people. I'm not sure hmm. if I'm, I'm butchering this concept, but then those who actually think like, I'm really good at this, they're actually mistaken. And it's this weird like duality that, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. so people that are actually more, I don't know if the word is like self-effacing, but they actually are better than what they they think they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then the opposite is true. Wow. So I don't know, that's just yeah. something that, that yeah, comes to I, mind. I think that, that kind of makes sense. I think there's, I think there might be something to that because you know, I think that uh, you have to be relatively self-aware, I think, and uh, well, I, I guess you don't have to be, but I think self-awareness as a writer is a good thing because you essentially, and, and you know, but self-awareness gone unchecked can be unproductive. But if you can like find a mechanism or a way to where you can use that as a tool, as a way to like be able to look at something critically, but look at it later critically, that's a really good skill to have um, because it allows you to empathize with people, which is really all that we're trying to do in our stories is like create empathy between the audience and the characters. That's all we're trying to do. And so uh, that's a, I think that people that might think like, I'm terrible at this. Uh, I know I'm in that crowd. Um, like, I think that can be a strength when used like a tool, you know, used in a very calculated way of like, okay, I wrote this thing, it's really bad. How can I, I know it's bad, how can I make it good? How can I do that? And that sort of like, not assuming that you have all the answers to things, uh, I think can open your you up to making much better work in the long term. It reminds me of like the two characters in Adaptation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just, Love that movie. <laughs> so, you know, you see the one character, and I forgive right. me for the name of this, Nick, yeah, Nicholas yeah, yeah. Cage, the one that the, uh -huh. feels, and, and you, you know like there's, <laughs> There's so much, but it's just a matter of what he feels about himself. Yeah, And the exactly. other guy is like, 
is like just pumping it out. Yeah. And it's like, I think I sold this already, right. man. <laughs> Women on both sides, nice car, you know, all these things. And yeah. it's just like, it doesn't make sense. But you see that sometimes in life totally. and you wonder, yeah. how is that possible? Well, yeah. I think it's sometimes it's just all of someone's perception of themselves. And it's, Absolutely. it's this weird thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like what you, what you think kind of is your reality, you know? Like if you think that you're terrible, like you're probably not going to pump out you're probably not even going to get the words out, you know? And so like, yeah, when I, when I, at least for me, cause I feel like in, in theory, I shouldn't be a writer cause I struggle too much with self-hatred. Um, but I learned, yeah, I learned that like, if you just give yourself permission to be terrible, you can do it. Cause everybody can be really bad at something, Sure. you know? Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, I think there's a, there's a John Lennon quote where he's like, I'm a musician. If you hand me a tuba, I'll get something out of it. You know? And like, I, I, I get that now. Mm -hmm. It's just like, all you, it, he didn't say it would be good. All he said was like, I can get something out of this, right, you know? Right. And I think if we create from that perspective, especially on like first drafts and first attempts of things, you really can't go wrong. Cause you can, anybody can probably get something out of a tuba. Yeah. You know? Might hurt your ears, but right. at first, but then it could exactly. get better. Yeah, it could exactly. shatter all the glass in the room, but that's okay. Cool. Alrighty. Oh, Here thank you. you. All right. Oh, great. From Flower Power. Hey there. Um, my question is, how do you get producers to read your script? I don't have any money or connections. How do I approach this? Just try to get lucky? That's a really good question. I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> but uh, the, the one thing that I have learned is like uh, Hollywood uh, is incredibly relational in the sense of like, because in theory, it's like, it's really bad. Like I, I used to always think like, okay, well, why does this writer make it and this one doesn't? Like, what's the difference? Why does this director not and why does this one not? And like the reality is like, it's not, it's not fair. <laughs> Uh, like life is not fair uh, in Hollywood in particular is definitely not fair uh, and like I, I don't mean that to knock it but what, what I mean is like uh, basically the I think when I began to realize that there are no rules then it sort of opened up for me of like like for instance I, I literally heard this story uh, the other day there was like a uh, I, I know this producer friend who got a movie made literally because he knew like the stunt man that worked on the movie with that actor and he <laughs> asked for him to pass the script over. Wow. And somehow, it seems like in theory that should not work, but somehow it worked. And so he was able to attach an actor to his script and boom, it started, it got made basically. It was like a horror film or something like that. But. But uh, basically it's like, that's, there's no like way. <laughs> it, it seems like in my limited experience, I've only been, uh, I guess, out here uh, total like seven years, but three of that I was in film school. So it's only been about four-ish years I've been trying to crack this, this thing called Hollywood. But the, I, I do know that like, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm very introverted, so it's like difficult for me a lot of times to like get out and meet people. And so I've noticed though, that when I start uh, becoming more relational with people, things start to happen. I'm not saying that like, that means like, I'm gonna be writing on HBO next week, you know, but like just, uh, I've noticed that every single year I've been out here, I notice more things that make LA feel smaller, if that makes sense. So. Right. Like for instance, the other day I was watching a commercial and I saw, uh, I saw a friend that I knew on that commercial. And I was like, oh, I know him. I met him last year. That's him, he's on TV. And, uh, and then the other day I was driving down the street and I saw a billboard and I was like, that's Billy. What's Billy doing? You know, and it's, it's crazy. And, and every year that seems to happen a little bit more, just a little bit more. And I know that like just sustained effort over time should eventually equal breaking into Hollywood, whatever, whatever that is, you know what I mean? And so like, I think that, you know, I definitely don't have, you know, uh, an answer to that, but just from my experience, I've noticed that things have started to happen for me uh, by 
uh, interfacing and, and uh, hanging out with people who are like-minded, who, uh, who you jive with, who like, you feel like a connection with. Because I think a lot of times, uh, you know, one of the pieces of advice a lot of people say is like, oh, you gotta network, just network, you know? But networking inherently feels, feels like not relational. It feels very sort of transactional, at least in my brain. And so for me, I've sort of tried to tip it to think like, okay, well, I'm just trying to find other like-minded people who I connect with and then try to pursue that great feeling of, of putting a movie on the screen or telling a story or doing something or, you know, and it, it's not just movies, it can be anything. Any sort of story that moves people, like if we can find a way to connect on that, then we can become allies and we can uh, fight for each other and, you know, be in the trenches together. And, and that's been a really beautiful thing so far since I've sort of taken that that uh that approach um you know like uh like i said i'm still super new uh at this whole pursuing uh filmmaking career stuff but you know i i I do know that i think if if you just don't give up and just keep meeting people uh connecting with people who you like and they like you back eventually uh something is going to happen like they uh I don't even remember what the quote is, but it's something along the lines of like, you know, the people that get lucky, uh, it's like luck is opportunity meets like preparation, you know, like that's what luck is. And so like the more opportunities you have, the more people that you start to get to know, uh, that know what you do and like what you do, eventually there will be an opportunity for you to be able to step up and, and do something, you know, and, and there will be long stretches of time where nothing happens and it feels like you're not making any progress. Uh, I literally just got out of a very long stretch of time where I felt that way, where I was just like, what am I doing out here? I want to move back home. I'm wasting my time. It's super expensive to live out here. This is awful. Um, But like something twisted, something turned in my brain. I was like, you know what? I may not know anybody at these big studios that can just give me a movie, but I do know a lot of people out here that are on my level or people, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say level, but uh, who are on their same, like, uh, same progression in their journey, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, I know all these people, and what I can do is I can just, like, connect with the ones that I I feel get me and understand me. And, you know, I've I've started that process maybe, like, maybe, like, four months ago. And, like, it's been amazing, like, how many just opportunities have come from that, from just, like, okay, well, I know this writer who was in my class. Let's just grab coffee and talk to each other and see how we might be able to help each other. And that's been phenomenal. Like, uh, I mean, like you can get your script to people that way, you know? Um, another thing that I, I, I have a friend who ended up getting representation because like uh, she ended up meeting with her friends that were repped by a rep. <laughs> like any person who was repped by someone they went and met with them and like uh, basically felt it out like is this a good fit first like do I feel like I connect with this person if they did and and everything seemed right she'd be like hey it might be a, a, a huge ask but like would you take a look at my script and not asking hey will you take a look and give it to your rep just like hey will you read it and if you like it could you maybe pass it on if not no harm no foul and uh, they were they seem to be pretty successful doing it that way but there's just so many different avenues but there's really no one way it's Hollywood seems to be the wild wild west and I think like at least for me that's what makes it intriguing <laughs> of like oh man the 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 next uh, the next thing could come from anywhere you know but there is oppor- there's way more opportunity around us than I think sometimes we feel you know it's only just a matter of focus and attention. Like if you focus on the world being abundant instead of scarce, then suddenly the world becomes abundant. And I've, I know it sounds really weird, but like I've, I've noticed when I've made those conscious choices, uh, things seem to happen. Alrighty, just blend it up here. Cool, there. Okay.
This is from, uh, sorry if I'm saying your name incorrectly, uh, Gabor uh, Rosa. Hello, Gabor. Um, when the movie is done, how can you reach the audience? What's the marketing strategy? How do you communicate with the crowd successfully? Ooh, that's, great question. That's a great question. I have a lot to say okay. about this. Uh, okay. Um, well, I think that, okay, I don't want to get too whatever here, but uh, okay, so I think that like, my marketing strategy has basically been like, I want to build up a big email list of people that I can then sell the movie directly to when we do a, a digital release later this year. That's been my marketing strategy. And uh, the reason why it's, it's like email as opposed to, uh, you know, Facebook or Twitter and things like that is because like the reality is that like uh, when we when we think of like what a platform is uh, a platform is basically a way where you can where you can reach the people that you need to reach in a way that usually is cost effective and just effective like in terms of getting someone's attention and then getting them to do something right and uh, the issue, uh, at least for, for me, with like uh, social media and things like that is I think sometimes people think that those are platforms, but they're, they're really not, though. And the reason why I don't think that those are platforms is because it's like very, very, like, like for instance, like with, with Facebook, you know, they're, they're constantly tweaking their algorithm, right? And so like, you know, we've got, uh, we've got a few thousand followers for uh, Then There Was Joe, we've got... 12,000 followers for Then There Was Joe on Instagram, but like such a very small percentage of those people actually see anything I post. And that's because of an algorithm. An algorithm that's like, okay, well we can't just post that and then boom, 12,000 people see it. And I think a lot of people think that's how it works, but that's not how it works. And so to me, if, if I have 12,000 people that have expressed interest and like, I really like that, but I can't reach them, then that's not an effective tool to get their attention and get them to do something. Uh, so for me, uh, my my strategy is to yeah is to build up an email list, and um, because the great part about email is email is decentralized. Like it's not uh, no one owns email. You know, it's like email is like an older technology, but it's from a time period where like the web was more open than it is now. You know, because uh, you know, and, and, the, and the great part about like an email list or something, because like if Facebook ever goes under or Instagram ever goes under, which history says they probably will, it could be 20 years from now, it could be 30 years from now, but I guarantee you at some point people are gonna get tired of Instagram and there's gonna be a new thing and they're gonna move on to that thing, right? I can't take those people with me to this new thing, right? But email you can take anywhere and it's something that you uh, if you build up an email list, you own that list. That's something you can take anywhere, and that's empowering. And uh, email has the highest engagement across any sort of, uh, on the entire internet, email has the highest engagement. Uh, more than Facebook, more than Twitter, all these different things. And so uh, that that is my strategy, build an email list, sell it directly to those people. Um, and I've I've done little small experiments, and it's like, phenomenal it's incredible right so like the you know my my premiere that, that we had in in arkansas um for the uh with the arkansas cinema society with jeff nichols uh we we sold out that premiere with one email oh wow i literally sent one email it's like hey guys just want to let you know our tickets are available you can get them right here thank you so much see you at the show sold out wow Pretty how, incredible. How many seats? Uh, 315 seats. Oh, wow. Just sold them out like that. It was pretty mm -hmm. amazing. It was pretty cool. Like, uh, with, with that email, we sold almost the entire theater, and then, like, a day later, it was sold out. Wow. It was pretty amazing. And, right. like, uh, that's, that, I think, is, like, if I were to just update my Facebook status, that wouldn't happen. It probably wouldn't happen to that degree. You know what I mean? Um, and also, like, too it's tough like with these social media platforms like when you post something you don't really know who sees it like there's no way of there's hardly a way to like you know people can like it and you can see who likes it but people seeing it there's no you don't really have access to that data you know um so 
it's been uh, that's my that's that's my strategy. It's very simple, but just build up an email list, sell the movie to those people, and there's there's uh, tons of examples of this working like in in publishing, right? So like uh, in book publishing, um, that's like kind of the book publishing model uh, is like a lot of these authors that already have massive email subscribers, massive email lists. Uh, those are the ones that usually get book deals. Mm-hmm. It's not the other way around because now, like uh, a lot of these uh, big traditional companies, they look for people who have already built audiences up, and then they they go like, "Hey, do you want to do something together?" And I think, and a lot of times we look at these things and they. Because they, it used to operate another way. It used to operate like, oh, that person has talent. Cool, let's do that, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll create a band, and then boom, they're huge. You know what I mean? But now it's kind of the other way around. It's like they look and see who's already huge, and they're like, okay, cool, we can take them and put them to the next level. You know? Yeah. And so I think that uh, audience building, uh, crowd building, whatever sort of building that, uh, you know whatever we want to call it these days I think like in many ways I think it's the future in a lot of ways like um, to gather your own crowd that you can talk to in a way that is cost effective and extremely uh, effective in terms of getting someone's attention and being able to uh, gather all the people around you that are like-minded in the sense of like they like your work uh, I think that's really powerful, and I think that the the world is only going to move further in that direction over time. It's going to be the people who uh, successfully build their audiences in a way that, like those people, very much pay attention to them, you know. And like, and for some people, that's that's not uh, that's not email. Uh, but you know, there's some people who, you know, if you're Kevin Hart and you've got forty something million people on Instagram or some, uh, or, or something, it's like you're going to reach a pretty huge chunk of those people. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right. <laughs> when, when did you start building your email list and how? Yeah. So uh, I started building my email list uh, about a little over a year ago. Uh, and like I've learned it's very difficult to get people's email addresses <laughs> for them to willingly give them to you because that's the that's the magic like they have to be like yes I opt in to this thing and uh, you know it's been a really slow process but we've we've gathered a decent amount considering how many people we have on like social media and stuff like that um, like we have about 1500 people on our email list now which is like eh, it's okay uh, you know, and it's it is just, hard to get emails. Sorry, it yeah. is. Yeah, it is hard. Yeah, yeah. it's super. It's super tough. Uh, but like, I I think that there are ways that uh, there are definitely ways to accelerate that process that I haven't explored yet. That I plan to explore over the next year or so. But uh, it so far it's been it's been like super effective and way more so than than uh, getting likes on Facebook or anything like that. I'm not saying that doesn't have any value. But uh, like I have been able to uh, to utilize to actually galvanize my my audience, my people more through that channel, through email, than I have through uh, any other channel. So. And what email program do you use? Uh, I use Mailchimp. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. just super simple. Um, and like uh, I also try to like make my emails seem like they're just written by a guy, like a, just a dude. In a like probably in his sweatpants, you know, uh, because eating like I, Doritos or right, you know, eating Doritos home, yeah. and just like probably needs to reapply his deodorant, you know, like that's how I try to uh-huh. talk to people, you sure. know, because like I think when you get something, uh, when you get something that's like a, looks like an official newsletter, I think sometimes people can be like, oh, it's just from a thing, but like <laughs> right. I, 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 for me, I like when I think of like. I try to imagine it of like, what would it, what would I like, how would I like to be talked to um, if like my favorite creator was talking to me, you know? Like if, let's say like Charlie Chaplin was sending emails, like how would I want him to send an email to me? And it'd be like, I want to just be like a regular guy. Like, hey, I've made this thing and uh, you know, I trip over some stuff and you'll like it, you know? <laughs> that's how I would want him to talk to me. So I'd, I'd try to, that's how I try to uh, talk to people, just like, uh, there's a dude, and he made something. Hopefully, you like it. 